All right, let's start the final session of this workshop. Uh, okay, the, the speaker is Bill Jin Yi from KIAS, and uh, the title is Anomalies and Supersymmetry uh, 1 plus 11. Okay, please start. Thank you. Uh, before I start, I'd like to thank all the local organizers for putting up this very nice uh, meeting. I'm honored to be closing the meeting by giving the last talk. And here we are. So, uh, I mean, you might wonder why I have this funny title, Anomalies and Supersymmetry 1 plus 2. And the reason is, those of you who attended the Osaka meeting a few weeks ago would know, in that meeting, I, I was able to give only first half of this story. So real aim today is the second half. On the other hand, if I just give a second half, which is mostly computational, things, you will be completely confused. So I really have to repeat the first step, hopefully better than last time. So here we are. So this is about how to deal with uh, anomalous theory. I mean, say flavor anomaly or isometry anomaly or gravitational anomaly in the presence of supersymmetry. At the moment, mostly about uh, global supersymmetry rather than supergravity although part of the story does cover the gravitational case as well. So here are five parts. Uh, so I will br very briefly review anomalies, uh, anomaly descent, anomalous water identity, just for the sake of setting up the problem. Um, and then I need to recall the diffeomorphism anomaly actually, or more precisely diffeomorphism water identity because we all think we know what's going on with diffeomorphic or gravitational anomaly. Turns out may maybe that's not true. Uh, at, at least I was, I think, uh, oblivious of some aspect of this diffeomorphism anomaly, which is different from usual gauge anomaly. And that turns out naturally leads to the question of supersymmetry in the presence of anomaly. And then, that would be first part of this talk. And for the second part, I will go on and illustrate further uh, by saying how anomaly inflow, which is essential in, for example, string theory, because string theory, everything is gauge symmetry. Uh, this anomaly inflow is extremely important part of uh, super string theory. And we need to understand it's how it does in the presence of supersymmetry, which I think is fit something people want that we're aware of. And finally, I will go to, again, very old story of BRS symmetry and how anomaly descent comes about from this. It turns out it's also very incomplete. And in fact, it's incomplete even for diffeomorphism. So I will, I mean, in, in, throughout, Today, it's a diffeomorphism and supersymmetry will come sort of alternate with each other. Super diffeomorphism giving you a little bit clearer example, and then supersymmetry giving you a little bit more complicated example. So anomalous word identity, everybody knows what it is. If you compute, if you perform a path integral of chiral fermion that's coupled to some gauge field, and you compute, it, if you perform the entire path integral, you end up with a functional of the gauge field. And if you take a gauge transformation of that gauge field, ideally, of course, you should have nothing. You should, I mean, gauge transformation delta lambda should kill this effective action. But sometimes, depending on the chiral content, that doesn't happen, and that's called anomaly. And how do you compute the anomaly? We all learn how to do it using by solving the so-called best minimum consistency condition. This effective action is horrendous non-local functional, yet this variation on the gauge transformation is supposed to be a local functional, and it obeys some consistency condition that comes from the symmetry algebra. One of the important things I need to remind you, which you should have learned, is this delta lambda gauge transformation is really gauge transformation that acts only on the dynamic or field variable, I should say, never touches the other guys, other parameters. And that's very central 
when you derive this consistency condition. And how do you solve this? We learn to solve this by learning so-called BRST symmetry or BRST algebra, where you elevate the gauge symmetry, which used to be called lambda, and now it is called V, and you invent this Grassmannian matrix valued function and extend the gauge field into such a BRST form. And then usual exterior derivative is similarly extended to include this BRST form of the gauge transformation S. What is different here essentially is this gauge transformation does act on the gauge parameter in this uh, suggestive way, unlike the previous one. And by having this, there is very simple way to solve uh, this best consistency condition. So somebody gave you anomaly polynomial, which is basically a product of the field strengths, which for topological expression like this, which is of course D of something, and this something is called transcendent uh, density. And using the fact this extended BRST gauge field or BRST field strength is actually identical to good old field strengths of this ordinary gauge field F. This is called Russian formula. If we get a bunch of relations when you expand the, uh, the transcendent density in terms of both numbers, and one of them, this particular one with both number one, it, it supplies the solution to best similar condition. And that happens because uh, in this identity here, one of them is exact. So therefore, when you integrate over space time, it doesn't do anything. And this S acts not only on the field, but also the variable, the, the transformation variable in such a way it produced those two terms you see in the best domino consistency condition. So this is how you learn to solve best domino condition using BRST algebra. Okay. And of course, somebody need to compute this anomaly polyn polynomial for you. And of course, the main reference for that is Alvarez Gomez written. But I, one thing I need to point out here is that with what they computed is not actually what we call consistent anomaly, this guy, but rather something called covariant anomaly, which takes this particular form, which is essentially a local modification or counterterm modification of consistent current or nether current by some local functional of your gauge field, external gauge field. So this is called body in current. It will appear everywhere today. So let's remember this. Now the question we will ask today is what happens if you have a bunch of different symmetries? Mostly they don't care about each other, but sometimes one symmetry affect gauge field of entirely different symmetry. And when does that happen? It happens when this one symmetry is essentially space-time symmetry. It's, it could be diffeomorphism, it could be supersymmetry, if it is supersymmetry, for example, it will act on every possible field in your theory. So even if you have a say flavor gauge field somewhere, supersymmetry will act on it and generate this additional term on the right hand side of, of the word identity. So when that happens, I mean, we cannot ignore this term. So there's, there should be some gauge current that appears here, even though you are making a supersymmetry transformation. So what happened to this? Is there something else that's going on on the anomaly itself? And what's going on with this current term for the internal symmetry when you ask this? So again, of course, we need to solve best domino consistency condition by including both type of uh, different uh, both type of symmetry transformation. So lambda here will uh, in, in this talk will denote say flavor and gauge. Uh, transformation, phi will denote mostly diffeomorphism and uh, supersymmetry. So for example, when, when I write something like this, when phi represents supersymmetry or diffeomorphism, I mean, what is the right-hand side of this? So there are two questions here. 
what happens to the left hand side when this represents Suzy or diffeomorphism transformation? And is there something we need to think about on the right hand side in this additional current term? So those are the questions we ask today. Now, in order to be able to address this, uh, I mean, of course, on the left hand side, we will see this uh, anomaly expression coming from anomaly descent. And then we will end up having to uh, sort of perturb the gauge field, say, for example, flavor gauge field with respect to supersymmetry or with respect to diffeomorphism. So we end up asking about arbitrary shift of the gauge field that has nothing to do with the symmetry uh, this anomaly is related to. So for that part, there is that I'm going to denote by delta of A. So given any gauge field, I'm just transforming it by arbitrary one form, appropriately matrix value. And of course this happens and we need to be able to handle this. And for that, turns out Bardin and Jumino in their classic paper already gave what to do. There is a very simple, very important uh, object, this L operator, which they call antiderivative for a reason. And it has this funny rule where if you take, if it acts on the field strengths, you end up getting this one form shift of the gauge field. If it acts on the gauge field, it just kills it. If it acts on this, the Grassmann gauge parameter, it kills it. So this is a very simple set of rules, which is true. And this you can use. And for example, suppose you take this Chan Simon density that's so important for your anomaly inflow. And you suppose you transform Arbitrary with arbitrary A, and the object you end up, one of the object you end up is in a product between the shifted gauge field and some say D minus one from current density. And this bar is called what we know, what we call body in current. And the importance of this body in current, as I hinted earlier, which take, by the way, for example, this form. In four dimension, if you have anomaly polynomial, is this stupid one. This looks similar to John Simon's density, but it's different, very different. For example, this wouldn't be uh, gaze invariant on the small gauge transformations. This is what as two nether current, so-called consistent current, such that the combination become a covariant thing. In such a way, if you take divergence of this covariant current instead of this consistent current, the anomaly that appears on the right-hand side is itself co uh, the covariant uh, quantity. It's in fact uh, given directly by the anomaly polynomial where you replace one of the field strengths by lambda, the gauge transformation parameter. And it has this well-known transgression form formula. So, Let's come to diffeomorphism. Another thing that I need to, I mean, I, 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 it seems like I have to do a lot of history lessons. Uh, one, one thing I need to emphasize from the beginning about the, the diffeomorphism anomaly is the usual uh, gravitational anomaly you used to think about is not actually diffeomorphism anomaly. The usual one is really gauge anomaly that's associated with SOD gauge transformation of the spin connection. So what you do is treat as if omega is a gauge field on the SOD gauge group, and you compute the anomaly descent in the usual way, and that's what we call Lorentz anomaly. And what is of course well known from the 80s is cancellation of this Lorentz anomaly implies cancellation of diffeomorphism anomaly and vice versa. However, if you actually write down diffeomorphism word identity, this is not the expression you will see simply because that's not the diffeomorphism transformation. If you actually take diffeomorphism transformation of spin connection, you have this rotational gaze, gaze rotation like piece, but you do have this additional piece, which is essentially a trans, uh, translational. By the way, this 
matrix is called Hossmann lift, uh, found only as late as 1970s. Anyway, the two things are not the same. So even though anomaly, as for the anomaly cancellation, this is enough. If you actually write down a field theory, which says gravitational anomaly, this is not the expression you expect to see in the word identity. Now, how do you get that actual diffeomorphism uh, anomaly? What you have to do, it turns out, is use a different approach to Riemannian geometry using the Christopher connection. And again, Christopher connection shift on the uh, arbitrary uh, the diffeomorphism by rotational part and translational part. So what does happen is the consistency condition, you can sort of compute using this, the same way that best Shumina would have. And on the right-hand side, it's not commutator of matrices, but lead bracket. And funnily, there is this minus sign, which is very important. So at the end of the day, the best you know, consistency condition when you include diffeomorphism in the story has this set of rules with L being lead derivative. Of course, this is also lead derivative, but with this extra minus sign. Uh, best and Bardin and Jumino knew all of this, of course, and they, they went through the computation and realized, in fact, you can compute diffeomorphism anomaly using sort of similar idea. And at the end of the day, the answer is simply that if you pretend this is GLD linear, uh, the rotational anomaly descent, it happened to solve this Abessumino uh, condition, which is with diffeomorphism. So this is very non-trivial result that you can show. And that's available in this classic paper. And let me not go through you know, actual computation of this, because we will come back to this. But what, what is important, I mean, once you accept this fact, what does happen is this, the variation of effective action has this solution, even in the, sorry, even in the presence of gauge field, uh, uh, gauge symmetry. In such a way, the anomalous part, the anomaly that is the diffeomorphism transformation of effective action is actually gaze invariant. On the other hand, the, the other side of word identity has not only divergence of energy momentum, but also this piece because diffeomorphism acts on everything. So it shifts your gaze field and in, induce the gaze connect, the gaze current, the nether current, which is what you call consistent. So if you look at three pieces, this is gaze invariant. This is gaze invariant, but is it gaze invariant? Uh, it should be at the end of the day, but how does that happen in detail it is relatively recent. And I think it was first paper, I mean, uh, uh, Ian is correct me wrong if that's not the case, but I think it was Jensen uh, and AR about 10 years ago who realized this. Turns out when you go through the definition of lead uh, derivative, it sort of organizes itself such that what used to look not quite gaze invariant at the end of become gaze invariant. And along the way, of course, the anomaly of this flavor of symmetry turns itself into this body in Jumino current. Otherwise, this could not happen. So magically, although it should happen, this piece, this additional piece, become gaze invariant on its own. So this is sort of kind of story we will see again and again in this paper. When you look at a uh, word identity of some space-time symmetry, potentially anomalous uh, gaze internal symmetries uh, current shows up because of this induced month. But in such a way, they, at the end of the day, things organize themselves automatically such that instead of nether current, consistent current, you end up with this funny covariant current. So this, for some reason, happens. Okay. 
So this is the feomorphism story. So this sort of tells me, uh, I mean, reminds me of, I mean, this confusion when I was first learning about this uh, anomaly, covariant current versus consistent current. Some paper talks about co a consistent anomaly, some other paper talks about covariant anomaly. And it took me a while to connect those two. But at the end of the day, it's really consistent current and consistent anomaly, which it should, be, it should be regarded as a physical one, because it's the failure. I mean, the failure of the symmetry is directly reflected in variation of effective action. And that's where this consistent anomaly. So for a while, I thought this covariant version is sort of intermediate step. For example, average from a witness computation of anomaly polynomial. But this tells me that's not quite true. So if I'm considering a particular internal uh, gauge symmetry, flavor or gauge symmetry, and ask about this anomaly, it is consistent anomaly, consistent current that shows up as it should. However, if I'm talking about sort of their inducement because you are considering some space time a word identity, then something else happens. And these current that in, get induced indirectly uh, show up in the form of covariant current. So covariant current, contrary to what I thought before, is very physical thing. So this is one lesson of this uh, investigation. So on the other hand, diffeomorphism if you think about it, and if you think about, for example, global supersymmetry, supersymmetry is in some sense square root of diffeomorphism, or at least translation. So if something like this happens in diffeomorphism, it should have something similar should happen in supersymmetry. So in some sense, this is the starting point of this uh, question. So what should be solved, the best, what is the best Schumann consistency condition to solve? The Suzy Suzy part, you can understand easily because if you do pair of Suzy transformation, you end up uh, generating a shift like this. This last thing should be a little bit non-trivial, but this is true if you choose the so-called best Schumann gauge choice for the vector multiplet A. And we will sort of mention what happens if you do not do this. But this looks rather trivial, right? Two things commute and therefore, oh, if there is no genuine supersymmetry anomaly in the cohomological sense, you know, left-hand side should be zero. That would be a natural thing to think. But what happens is that this banishing of this commutator actually implies that this part, the variation of effective action, on the supersymmetry cannot be zero if there is anomaly associated with this flavor symmetry. And you can sort of see it rather easily because the two things are supposed to commute, but you already know the anomaly of the flavor symmetry, for example, is given by anomaly descent. You try to shift it and you do this uh, anti-derivative operation I, I mentioned earlier, and you end up with some quantity like this, and you go further and you find you have some integration of something and variation of this uh, uh, under the gaze transformation. So that's the starting point, that's the end point. And therefore what this says, if that, internal flavor symmetry is anomalous, happen to be anomalous, supersymmetric transformation get affected. And in fact, Suzy transformation of effective action is not zero. So you might call it anomalous. I, I'm not sure that's the exactly right wording, but something happens, something non-trivial happens. And that something non-trivial is precisely captured by this body Jumino current I mentioned earlier that appears, uh, for example, in the story of diffeomorphism. And this, the piece, this was the piece that covariant ties the current, gauge current. And if you move that term to the other side, what you can see is in this word identity for the supersymmetry, you have divergence of supercurrent. You used to have delta epsilon 
the Suzy transformation of gauge field times consistent current. But this thing on the right-hand side, if you move to the other side, adds to this current and make the entire thing covariant. In the Bessumino gaze, Suzy transformation of gauge field is nothing but the gauge, you know? So this is also covariant. So the entire thing is covariant and the inner products are invariant. And then you have some leftover gaze invariant term. So that seems to have. So I said, this is going to, this is what happens if you choose Bessumino gaze that everybody use. What would happen if you do not choose Bessumino gaze and you insist on keeping every single auxiliary field? All that happens, I think, is simply this will be zero formally, and all non trivial terms that used to be on the right hand side move to the left, and actually more than that because you have more auxiliary field. In such a way, they combine themselves, similarly as in the diffeomorphism case, into something which is invariant on the gauge symmetry. So these two different viewpoints happen simply because Bessumino gauge essentially fix part of this chiral multiplet gauge, the uh, chiral multiplet that represent the gauge transformation and leave only the, both the usual ones behind. So in some sense, undo supersymmetric completion of the gauge function. So in this sense, uh, Suzy, the story I just outlined is supersymmetric completion or supersymmetrization of anomalies that you already know about, rather than a new cohomological super anomaly of supersymmetry. However, this does not mean that this is trivial. Okay? So in particular, in a lot of things that people have been computing last 10 years, uh, things like exact supersymmetric partition function, this does have consequences. So if you are not careful what you're computing, and if you are not aware of these additional pieces, you will end up saying wrong things. And I, would, I, I mean, those of you who are new to this, I would suggest this paper because it, it sort of came later and has a little bit better overview than earlier ones. Okay, so I ran very fast to summarize the part one. Uh, okay, uh, by the way, I, I probably should have emphasized that this story on the supersymmetric part, the last part, is not new. This is actually 36 year old story by Itoyama, uh, uh, who used to be in Colombia back then, Naya and Ren. So what they did is really solve exactly this. So they did solve this pair of things and they notice at the end of the day, you get this piece on the right-hand side and they computed example by example, this additional term, which involves three or more gazinos. This says one gazino but these would have three gazinos at least. So this is very old story. This story was rediscovered by Ioannis a few years ago, uh, more in the context of R symmetry and supergravity. So again, uh, Ioannis did this heroic uh, computation of solving Bessumino consistency conditions sequentially and got a lot of uh, result out of it. But I mean, that's fine, but I mean, it would be nice to have a little bit more systematic understanding of the structure of this anomaly, say on par with the usual anomaly descent, for example. So that's what I would like to outline in the, in the remaining 20 minutes, I hope. So before I get to supersymmetry version of anomaly inflow, let me do again very quick overview of anomaly. So simplest of anomaly situation is that our space-time is some d-dimensional uh, magnetic defect in higher dimensional space-time, which solve this uh, magnetic equation. And suppose you have topological coupling like this. So either this or this, but let me work on this ladder version. Um, probably sign here is wrong, this, you should trust only this sign. 
And if you do the gauge transformation, of course, this transform non-trivially because it's a transcyman density. And if you do the integration by part, you get the H width, what used to be anomaly. But on the other hand, this was a defect here. Therefore, D of H become delta function and you end up with this anomalous expression. So anomaly uh, inflow simply means that you have anomalous, what one of anomalous effective action. And if you do have this additional piece in the bulk, and if you combine the system, is could be anomalous, uh, non-anomalous. And this is generically what happens in superstring theory whenever you consider D brains and, and membranes and all that. So this is a very rich history. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not displaying the references because this is something you cannot find in standard textbooks by now. Now, once we know that this is possible, that gauge flavor diffeomorphism anomaly is canceled by anomaly flow from some bulk effective action, topological action, what should happen to this Itoyama Naya Ren effect, the supersymmetric version of that? Of course, if this effect is really Suzy completion of the canceled anomaly, this can the anomaly itself should be kept. I mean, the, the whatever consequences this Itoyama Naya Ren should be simultaneously canceled by the anomaly inflow due to this if you supersymmetrize this bulk topological term. So, what you should expect is something like this. So, does that happen? Again, it's very easy to see that that actually happens if you concentrate on this the leading uh, uh, term, which has single gaze in them. So again, you have supersymmetric transformation of that guy. It has actually two pieces, but what is important is that because you supersymmetrize the entire thing, there should be no bulk term remaining in all of this. And the only thing that will survive this transformation role, even if you do not specify exactly what this so the completion is, is this guy, okay? And therefore, at the end of the day, the transformation of supersymmetrized bulk action will have to give you, again, this body in current times gazing up. That's in inevitable, really. So what that implies, I'm not telling you about this remainder, but trust me that this uh, should be true is that if you have anomaly inflow correctly instituted at the level of supersymmetry, in the sense that bulk supersymmetry, the bulk effective bulk action, classical action is suitably SUSI completed, the, correct, the contribution, one loop contribution from this effective action, and the classical contribution from the inflow for the SUSI part, like this, has to cancel. And we see explicitly this happens. So if leading term cancel, the remainder should cancel. So even if I'm even though I'm not telling you anything about the SUSI completion, it should be very obvious that should happen. So this again sort of tells us the view that this particular anomalous term should be considered SUSI completion, but at the same time, this tells us maybe there is a simpler way to get at those gaze invariant SUSI completion if you knew how to SUSI complete this bulk action. However, of course, these topological terms are notoriously difficult to complete in terms of supersymmetry. This is very high derivative terms in higher dimension, and that not many are actually known to be how, I mean, we don't know many a Suzy completion of those things. However, there is a single class where we know Suzy completion reasonably well. And that is, of course, John Simons. If you start with John Simons theory in one higher dimension and realize my space time as the boundary of that space time rather than defect. And then, of course, this John Simon action will, 
will transform non-trivial Lyon water gaze transformation and generate this counteracting annual inflow. So all you have to do is supersymmetrize John Simon action. So if you know how to supersymmetrize D plus one dimensional John Simon action, you do the Suzy variation of, uh, of this, and then it automatically compute not only this part, which should be obvious, but these gaze invariant terms. So for example, the simplest class, non-trivial class where this happens is when D dimension is two, so that you go start with three dimensional John Simon flavor say, gaze action. Uh, and we know how to write down. Again, I'm, I'm missing out ref, old references. Uh, one of the people who invented this is of course, Kim Young who's sitting somewhere here. Uh, N equal three, this is maximal possible John Simon action when you have genetic gaze group, uh, which has three, three auxiliary, three uh, scalar partner. It has four Majorana doublet. And they are all auxiliary in a way. And if you do arbitrary, uh, this is a simple enough thing. So you do a Suzy transformation of this. And then of course, the entire thing is super symmetric. So whatever you, whenever you do Suzy transformation, the biggest thing you end up with is total derivative. And you end up with this counter term. So this is again, gaze, you know? So one gaze, you know? And so what, what, as I said earlier, uh, Ioannis did this computation by solving explicitly best Shimino consistency condition in earlier papers. And there are several such examples we could compare directly. And of course, every single example, this cancels the Itoyama Naya Ren effect precisely. So this does say, it is actually effective mechanism to, to solve the supersymmetrization of anomaly. So uh, the task was done in this paper that I'm talking about in this case, say this was this number two is the one I just outlined. A four dimensional one is a little bit more involved because five dimensional John Simon action is a little bit more involved, but it's all known and manageable. Uh, what was, I think, essentially new was D equal to diffeomorphism R symmetry anomaly. Uh, when you start with uh, N equals seven uh, John Simon supergravity, uh, so this part is going to be, I think most of this part is new in this paper. So if you are really interested in actual expression, you should either look at this paper or invite Ioannis. Even so, uh, supersymmetric completion of John Simon is increasingly difficult in higher dimension. And in fact, if you demand for higher uh, supersymmetry, they might be even absent. Of course, anomaly itself might be absent, so they might not be a big problem. But if you are asking this in six dimension, I wouldn't know how to start because I don't know how to uh, write down the supersymmetry John Simon action. So for now, at least at the level of this paper, the value of John Simon animal inflow as a computational tool is limited down to this. Uh, maybe somebody can compute this in higher dimension and, and does a little bit more, uh, but probably I will not be the one. Okay. Uh, I ran very fast. Uh, maybe I should pause and ask if there is any question. Okay. Excuse me, uh, I have yes. one question. So could you go to the previous slide? This uh, one? Yeah, 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 so here you say that uh, using Chan Simon's action, so you can reproduce the Suzy anomaly in D equal two and four. Right. But uh, does your method works in odd dimensional field theory? Say D, D equals three. Oh, we are talking about perturbative anomaly here. Uh -huh. So, I mean, perturbative anomaly, of course, exists only in well, even dimensions. So, we are not talking about uh, the, the, these discrete anomalies. But, but isn't there any 
Oh, I see. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So this is, I mean, rather old quantity that we are all used to. I mean, this is a thing that I thought I understood completely. And it was a big surprise for me that I didn't. So this is standard textbook material. It should have been, but there are bits and pieces that were missing. And in fact, a lot of things I, I told you, I mean, you probably saw this reference, Badin Jumino, uh, Itam and I ran. So uh, a lot of this was sort of scattered in the literature in the 80s and 90s, in fact. And same is true about what I'm going to talk about next. Okay, let me go on. So again, BRST algebra, you are all very familiar with. I outlined how you get anomaly descent automatically or solution to anomaly Bessumina consistent condition, more or less free out of this very simple BRST algebra. So this was sort of thing. Now, the important thing that you need to remember is the gauge symmetry whose anomaly can be computed this way is all rotational, internal, maybe I should say internal, but it's rotational anomaly. It could be you know, any gauge group, it could be any flavor group, it could be any R symmetry. It could also be a Lorentz symmetry rather than diffeomorphism, but diffeomorphism doesn't quite fit here. So as I said before, Bardin and Jumino in later section demonstrated the fact that if you compute this would be anomaly descent for GLD gauge transformation like this, that actually solves diffeomorphism, diffeomorphism, best amino consistency condition. But this one does not follow from BRS realization of this kind because the S, the transformation, has to be standard gauge transformation, even if, I mean, the and the diffeomorphism is not like that. Diffeomorphism always involves translational component. Sometimes you do not have this rotational part, but this translational part is a must. Of, uh. So we actually need, even for this very old diffeomorphism anomaly, if we want to embed it in the PRST algebra realization, we need something else, in fact. Let me do that first. And then exactly the same mechanism will be useful for supersymmetric version. So start with the same old rotational BRST. Again, you extend gauge field by adding this Grassmannian uh, gauge function. Uh, again, this famous Russian identity, even if you compute the field strengths using this new operator and new gauge field, it end up being identical to vanilla uh, non-BRST uh, field strengths. On top of this, what I'm going to do is add one more o BRST order operator C in this way. I'm not going to change anything here. So this could be anything. This could be uh, a gauge symmetry. This could be a GLD uh, rotation which does not have translation. And that translation in diffeomorphism case will be entirely blamed on this additional operator. And using this additional extended uh, the operator, which is uh, <clears throat> uh, nil potent again, that's of course important. I would construct a new field strength H. And unlike this guy, without C, what happens is that it acquires another one more term. This funny operator I didn't really define yet, acting on this extended gauge field. So this is new part. On the other hand, if you think about the Bianchi identity, how Bianchi identity holds, it really doesn't care about exactly what is the gauge field. All that care about this is this uh, the uh, <clears throat> nil potency of this exterior differential. Oops. So what happens is that this new field strengths do obey exactly the same Bianchi identity as before. Okay, so this is important. And the fact that H is not 
in this case, same as vanilla field strength. So you, you play exactly the same game as before. Given some anomaly polynomial, you place the field strength F by this H. Because the Bianchi identity still holds on H, what this implies is that this is again exact with respect to some uh, John Simon like thing, but now involving this shifted B and shifted H. Okay. And you look at the two side and you try to expand this anomaly polynomial. It used to be just this when H was equal to G here, right? But H is no longer same as F. So now we have this uh, graded expansion where K is the ghost number. So V is the same rotational ghost, but Y I collectively denote everything else, all of the ghosts that has something to do with the, this additional C transformation. So this is a new starting point. So it's not, this is not same as this anymore, but you do have this additional pieces, okay? Now, again, you do exactly the same game as in old BRST. You, you expand the John Simon density with argument which are BRST gauge field and BRST field strength and expand in ghost number whose D, who's, uh, on which if this operator BRST operator act, the important operator act, will produce this uh, anomaly polynomial in the BRST sense. But together, it implies this identity. So remember when I was talking about rotational symmetry, left-hand side was zero. This was exact, so it didn't enter the integration. So what happened was quantity that sit here automatically become the density for the, your anomaly that you are after, because this essentially annihilate this guy integrated over actual space time. But this, because of this additional piece, this additional piece, that's no longer true, right? So that's the complication you see. But what seems to be happening, in fact, I don't quite understand it, I mean, on the same systematic level as the old BRST symmetry, what does happen is that if shifted BRST operator represent a symmetry, what do happen is that this X guy has alternate exact solution. So, but this is not, I should warn you, this is not really exact solution because it has additional pieces, but this additional pieces is something that vanishes identically if you realize that you are talking about D dimension. You remember when you're doing anomaly descent in the old, old sense, uh, like here, I mean, you pretend during the computation as if, you know, you know the demand space time that's relevant for A and F is arbitrary. You do not restrict to D dimension. Otherwise you will end up with nonsense. But here for this additional piece, you need to realize that if you integrate over, what you need to do is at the end of integrate over your space time. So if, even if you have this additional piece dangling, it will be killed automatically if you integrate over the space time, simply because you don't have enough indices in your space time. So uh, the fact that this, uh, once you have this, what happens is that un unlike the vanilla BRST case, it's not W1 that represent solution to best consistency condition, but W1 minus that guy, which acts like a uh, consistency condition. Remember, a best consistency condition is uh, uh, included in the statement that whatever the expression you want to show, uh, you, you believe to be anomaly, is annihilated by this pair of BRS, BRST operator, okay? So if all of this is true, this quantity is going to be the anomaly you want to compute. And for this, diffeomorphism give you clearest example. So what you need to do is 
split your diffeomorphism into rotational part and the translational part. So the C is essentially gradient with some uh, arbitrary vector field X. So this is not the lead derivative. This is the lead derivative. This is only translational part of lead derivative. And you call this C, okay, do the algebra computation uh, step by step. And what you realize is X2 has this alternate solution that is almost exact modulo this piece, but this module, this extra piece just kills itself once you realize we are talking about actual D dimensional space time. So in fact, this is the relevant thing you want to consider because this part of course goes away uh, upon integration by, by part because this is total derivative. So this is what you want. So this is what you enter here which give you back the small w that you knew to be solution. This is exactly what Bardin Jumino told you that this is the diffeomorphism anomaly. What is new here is the entire thing, this solution you already knew to be solution to Bardin Jumino consistency condition is now completely elevated into the BRST algebra level. Okay. So it looks like I have to fly through the supersymmetry part. Uh, supersymmetry, the, the statement is very, very similar. Uh, what you need to do is keep this gauge part only. And supersymmetry Q should be accompanied by shift by constant vector. And by the way, both alpha, the, the, the ghost, spinner value, the ghost, and the vector valued goals, both of them are uniform because we are talking about rigid supersymmetry. We don't know how to extend this to a super gravity yet because, and, and, and th these are all uniform quantities. And the algebra relevant for this is something like this, which was in fact written down by Kaiser many, many years ago. And uh, again, you do differential and BRST gymnastics. You again see uh, pieces like this, similar to diffeomorphism, but you do have this additional piece. Uh, I, it looks like I'm not going to have time to do the computation. Uh, I'm, I, I'm sure this slide will be available so you can follow uh, step by step. Again, this same antiderivative story enters, generate, this piece, which is Bardin Jumino piece, that is universal. There is additional pieces on the supersymmetry because of the C is a little bit different from the diffeomorphism case. And what is really important at the end of the day, and let me not go through this, is this. So it turns out you do have a solution again, BRS version of the solution. It has good old gauge symmetry on the, which would be annihilated by this S on its own. So additional piece generated is the same old uh, Bardin Jumino current piece I showed you uh, several different, uh, in, 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 in when I was solving in the earlier, in the first half, uh, contracted with a uh, gazino in this case, of course. And then you have this additional piece, which it comes from that guy left over. Uh, turns out there is this is gaze invariant, but not universal. This is gaze non-invariant, but universal. So I mean, there are some trade-off between the two. And there is, although this part is very much depend on, on exact realization of supersymmetry. One thing I can say universally is that if you do supersymmetry transformation of that guy, this one we know explicitly for any dimension, for any theory. So QA is of course a, a gauge transfer, the BRST version of supersymmetry transformation. So this will be basically uh, alpha, lambda, alpha times lambda, alpha times lambda and FFFF. Um, this is there is a proof of this. I don't know if this is really necessary. 
Uh, but what I want to say is that this is really a reproduction of what Ito Yamanaya rendered in the component form in four dimension and two dimension. Now it is lifted for all possible dimensions where supersymmetry exists and is lifted to BRST algebra. And it, the, 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 the mechanism that you really need to do this is exactly the same as the mechanism you need to do the diffeomorphism uh, anomaly descent, which was uh, somewhat surprising to me. Anyway, so I just flashed through this part. So this offers sort of almost constructive routine for this uh, uh, supersymmetrization of gaze and flavor anomaly, except of course you still need to solve this, but I don't think there is a really universal way of doing that. Uh, a lot of this is done by either Ioannis in his, uh, in his uh, solution in earlier papers, or some of them you can find in Kaiser, in, in, again, in component-wise form. So what are the lessons here? I, I think there are three lessons. Let's be more careful about anomalies when space-time symmetries are involved, and especially if the theory has uncanceled flavor gaze anomaly. And along the way, covariant current seems to have found a more physical role in all of this anomaly uh, situation. And one thing I really want to emphasize is there was some hoopla about this you know, supersymmetry anomaly. This supersymmetrization of anomalies I, I talked about in this uh, all of this is neither trivial nor irrelevant. I mean, in, for some question, it might be irrelevant if you ask about, you know, does it say change the super, does the Bose Fermi degeneracy? I think it does not. But for some other important questions like supersymmetric partition function, you should be very mindful about this uh, existence of these anomalous terms in the word identity. And then I'd like to advertise that this anomaly descent is now extended one more step and it was necessary, it turns out, to accommodate the diffeomorphism anomaly and the supersymmetrized version of flavor and gaze anomaly. But that's not end of story because that doesn't quite address the supergravity version of the same story. For some of those questions in two, two dimension, uh, we did compute those things using John Simon anomaly inflow. So that's the one, again, I didn't tell you in detail about. Uh, I'm sure there is a similar things to be done with higher dimensional transheimer anomaly inflow. Uh, but personally, I'd like to see a version of what I just told you about here, these kind of stories, when we involve a local supersymmetric theory. But that's sort of wishful thinking at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for interesting talk. So uh, it, it, the session is open for question and comment. Uh, and I, I see one question in the chat window. Can you see um, it? Yes, uh, I understand. Uh, the question is whether when you see the anomaly descent, the, the one has one ghost number is supposed to be anomaly. My question is, what about higher guys with more ghost numbers? Whether do they have physical meaning? N not that I know of. Uh, anybody knows? I don't think uh, I know of such a thing. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I mean, uh, mm, not in the usual context of the anomaly, but we are looking at sort of, we are discovering sort of new old effect that was hidden in, in our thinking. So maybe there is something new. I don't know. I answer is I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? Uh, let me ask one question. So uh, this covariant, uh, sorry, covariant anomaly, Right. Uh, appears in, for example, in the calculation of Fujikawa method. Uh, that's right, exactly. Yeah. So uh, can you 
do, do you expect that uh, you can get the su super symmetrized version by somehow using physical method with a super symmetric regularization or something like that? Mm, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, of course, I, although I did emphasize the covariant current is really important in when we talk about world identity, when it comes to anomalies, sir, covariant anomaly and consistent anomaly, I, I still think it's the consistent anomaly that become physical. So it's, it's sort of the, the, the left-hand side of this uh, world identity. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why I didn't really think about that question, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, of course, in, in Fujigawa and both in Fujigawa and, and uh, the Alvarez Gomez with Alvarez Gomez with is essentially generalization of Fujigawa. Uh -huh. And, and they, they say this different regularization. Whether do you, do you regularize with using a chiral Dirac operator, or do you regularize with, with, with non chiral Dirac operator? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So that, that sort of difference in terms of computational procedure. And um, yeah, but at the moment, I mean, if you do word identity at least, the thing that appears on the left hand side is always variation of the effective action, and yeah. that is always consistent anomaly. Yeah, that's right. So in that sense, covariant person, I cannot think of what what covariant anomaly, I should say, mm -hmm. what role it might play. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? Excuse me, I have one question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Could you go to the last slide? Uh, last slide, this? Uh, yeah, so what, what's the difference between rigid super symmetrized uh, anomalies and local? So, but symmetry anomalies. Oh, because uh, all I mean is, say, suppose I have a flavor symmetry Th theory that has flavor symmetry that is coupled to supergravity, right? So, what I talked about in the last part was if I coupled, uh, if I have a rigid supersymmetry, how Suzy completion should happen. But if it is coupled to supergravity anomaly, I, I'm sorry, supergravity its completion would be different. And also, if you are thinking about R symmetry anomalies and Lorentz anomalies or diffeomorphism anomaly in the presence of supergravity, its Suzy completion happens somewhat different, right? For example, in, instead of Gaysinos, you need to think about Gravitinos. So the, once you have a supergravity in the game, this BRST, uh, extended BRST I outline is no longer uh, strong enough. On the other hand, uh, in some of those lower dimensional examples, this computation we did with John Simon anomaly inflow does cover such examples in low dimension. So that will be full of supergravity multiplet in the uh, analog of Itoyama Naya Ren expression. So what I mean is, this, this rigid version I gave you at the end is at the moment incapable of accommodating, uh, yeah, here, this uh, transformation alpha being space-time dependent. I see, okay, thank you. I, I have one more question. So, mm -hmm. so if we have a uh, supersymmetrized anomalies, so does it lead some inconsistency of theory? So like uh, you cannot quantize, say, uh, your supersymmetric gain theory? No, I mean, so when, when we talk about, of course, in, in if I'm talking about string theory, so if I embed everything in string theory and think about the theory as a whole, all the anomaly has to cancel. So in that sense, there is no problem first. Uh, when we talk about things like this, we are really talking about uh, supersymmetry or flavor symmetry or diffeomorphism symmetry as a global symmetry, external symmetry, I should say, something that is not gazed. So for those external things, of course, anomaly is simply some funny, uh, 
uh, unexpected identity in the word, uh, word in the correlators, right? So that never leads to uh, inconsistency. Inconsistency might appear if you try to elevate those symmetry into gauge symmetry, but the only way we know how to do that consistently is of course string theory. And once inside the string theory, all the anomaly inflow begin to enter the story in such a way the cancellation is complete. So stories I was telling you about is relevant when you look at things like world volume theories. Some part, some field theory, uh, part of some bigger string theory, for example. And there it doesn't lead to any inconsistency. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Uh, let, let, let me ask another. So um, your formula, formulation, uh, your story uh, works for any dimension? At some point, I, I, thought, I remember uh, you mentioned that it's for lower dimension, two dimension, four dimension. Uh, so, right, so let's go to the last. Oops, sorry about that. So um, uh, lower dimensional things that we explicitly computed using chon simon anomaly inflow, those are relatively low dimensional things, two dimension and four, di uh, four dimension uh, explicitly. Uh, uh. So one of the problem is that, uh, I mean, because chon simon uh, supersymmetrized so Chan Simon theory does not exist beyond, say, n equal three in three dimensions. So there is that restriction. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you ask similar question about more higher supersymmetric theory, especially in the context of R symmetry, right? With you know largest supersymmetry, you do have R symmetry anomaly, for example. Mm -hmm. So for those, you need something else. And that's why I started looking at this extension of BRSD symmetry, because this is potentially uh, uh, something somewhat orthogonal to John Simon version. So for example, uh, when, when I was writing down this, this Q, this is done up to 16 supercharges actually, so maximal case. Mm -hmm. If you allow on share, because higher supersymmetry, you don't right. know how to option. Right. But that's really okay because mm -hmm. I mean those auxiliary things will, will not really, I mean, you have a choice to using and not using those auxiliary uh, field anyway. So mm -hmm. this approach for flavor and gauge internal symmetry rather than space-time like R symmetry or diffeomorphism is actually good for up to N, the maximal supersymmetry. I so there, there is, I mean, there is area that neither covers completely. Oh, oh, oh. I see. Thank you. All right. Uh, any more questions or not? Mm -hmm. Did someone raise hand? Ah, oh, no, no. <laughs> All right, so we don't see any more questions. So let's thank Firzi again.